Hello, and welcome to Linux Action News, episode 298, recorded on June 28th, 2023. I'm Chris. And I'm Wes. Hello, Wes. Let's do the news. We start with Linux 6.4's release, which Linus announced this past Sunday. I thought I smelled some fresh Linux. This was a low-key announcement. Uh, Linus wrote, quote, Hmm, the final week of 6.4 is done, and we mainly got some net filter fixes, some MM reverts, and a few tracing updates. Yeah, you kind of get the vibe this is a relatively bog-standard release. In fact, Linus even says the kernel developers themselves seem more focused on the upcoming 6.5 release. Great. Uh, that's good news for end users, I think. It sounds like 6.4 is just going to be a nice, stable, boring kernel. And um, there's a whole lot of people that like that from their kernel. Uh, but we don't, we don't mean to make it sound like there's nothing great in 6.4. In fact, it's really nice to see more upstreaming of various Apple M2 SoC support drivers. Uh, the AMD P-State driver got some serious improvements, as well as a bunch of other stuff. Yeah, like new Intel CPU support landing, and a plethora of driver updates, fixes, and even a performance optimization for your pal EXT4. Hey, it's good to see, right? And uh, speaking of performance improvements, and I suppose in the spirit of looking ahead to Linux 6.5, ButterFS is really just in a great place. Uh, it's gotten so mature, performant, and feature-rich. The last few years of regular updates are just continuing in Linux 6.5, and ButterFS users are going to be very, very pleased. More specifically, the gains come from refinements across the layers of the ButterFS stack, including simplified I.O. tracking, reading the extent buffer in one pass, and faster sync, plus, of course, bug fixes. And while we're talking about file systems, after BcacheFS's lead developer made a request for feedback and review, Kent Overstreet has integrated some of that feedback from upstream kernel developers, including the one and only Linus Torvalds himself. This week, Kent sent out a pull request with the aim of including this file system in Linux 6.5. Can you really be a significant player in the containerized development game if you don't have a graphical desktop interface? Well, Canonical has an answer to that question this week. They've announced early access to the LexD graphical user interface. They write in the announcement, We have received a lot of requests from users and the community for an official LexD UI to simplify operating your LexD instances. The community itself also developed projects to fill this gap. We are now happy to share that we have a team focusing on the user experience working on an official web UI. A whole team, and they also state... I don't advise you to use the new app in production yet. As you might have guessed, the UI is packaged as a snap, which makes it quick and easy to get up and going on any recent Ubuntu and likely many other distros. Once installed and started, you get a web UI that prompts you through some setup, and once you've completed that, you get a relatively comprehensive UI to manage instances, profiles, networking, storage, and even cluster support. Yeah. I mean, there might be some room for improvement in the, in the UI, but I'm sure that team will be working on that. But it impressed me enough that I want to dig in and play around with this more. And I think this actually could be my opportunity to actually play around with Lexty, which so far has never really stuck. In fact, none of these graphical user interfaces have stuck for me, but they're often Electron desktop apps or something like that that I just prefer to avoid. Just embracing the web app aspect of this, it works for me. Um, I don't know. We'll see. See if it sticks. I suspect it will open up container tech to a large user base that was just never going to bother with any of this stuff if they had to touch the terminal. The reports of Convergence's death have been greatly exaggerated. And it seems a big player might be going all in soon. A source within Google has revealed the upcoming Pixel 8 phones will feature USB DisplayPort alternate mode. And that will be coupled with a more powerful Tensor G3 SoC. Speculation online has led to more digging and revealed that this also works with a mouse and keyboard. Introduced back in 2017, Samsung's DeX has widely been recognized as one of the most popular ways to bring a desktop-like experience to Android devices. Yeah, and some of us likely recall Canonical's efforts on convergence, which really came together in 2013 with their Ubuntu Edge P3 
PC smartphone hybrid that was a $32 million crowdfunding attempt. The reality is this has been an idea developers and users have dreamed of since smartphones started to get more powerful. It does seem like Google could bring something here, maybe something like the Chrome OS experience, something similar to that. I don't know if Wes or I or maybe many of our listeners are the target market for this kind of product. We'll have to wait and see. But I do have to admit, I can't help but be sort of interested to see what Google tries here if this actually comes to fruition. This week, we learned Valve Software has hired Alyssa Rosenzweig as an ongoing contractor. Previously, she spent the last four years working at Collabora on Linux graphics. Right, and starting in 2021, she also began reverse engineering the graphics capabilities of Apple's M1 and M2 SoCs, while obviously collaborating with the Asahi Linux team to develop the AGX Gallium 3D code to enable OpenGL support on Apple Silicon. Then in April, it was announced that Alyssa would be stepping down as the maintainer of the Panfrost driver as part of her departure from Collabora. At the time, she chose not to disclose her future plans. But now we know she'll be working with Valve, and that has got us excited about what future improvements she'll be making to the graphics stack of Linux. Linode.com slash LAN. Go there to get $100 in 60-day credit on a new account. It's a great way to support the show while you're checking out the exciting news. Linode is now part of Akamai. All the developer-friendly tools, like the cloud manager that's beautifully built, the API that's well-documented, and the CLI that I find so handy. All the things that you use to build, deploy, or scale in the cloud, they're still available, but now they're combined with Akamai's power and global reach, and they're expanding their services to offer more cloud computing resources and tooling while still giving you that reliable, affordable, and scalable solution for any user or business of any size. And as part of Akamai's global network of offerings, data centers are expanding worldwide. They're investing big, giving you access to even more resources so you can grow your community, your project, your business. You can serve your customers, your friends, your family. So why wait? Go experience the power of Linode, now Akamai, by going to linode.com slash L-A-N. Go there to get $100 in 60-day credit and learn how Linode, now Akamai, can help you scale your applications from the cloud to the edge. Linode.com slash LAN. And thanks to Collide. Collide Collide.com slash LAN. Collide can help Okta users achieve 100% fleet compliance. If a device isn't compliant, the user can't log into your cloud applications until they fix the problem. And the moment Collide's agent detects a problem, it alerts the user and gives them instructions on how to fix it. If they don't fix the problem within a set time, they're blocked. It's that simple. Collide's solution ensures device compliance as part of authentication, which both reduces support tickets and IT frustration, while also ensuring 100% compliance. Learn more or book a demo at collide.com slash LAN. Last week, while we were away, we learned that Red Hat was making changes and would no longer be directly publishing their Red Hat Enterprise Linux source RPMs to the general public. Instead, now CentOS Stream will be the sole repository for public RHEL-related source code releases. This is a fundamental change in how Red Hat makes its RHEL product code available to the public. Yeah, so before CentOS Stream, Red Hat published public sources for Red Hat Enterprise Linux to git.centos.org. When the CentOS project shifted to CentOS Stream, Red Hat continued these repositories. They maintained them even though CentOS Linux was no longer downstream of RHEL. In public statements, Red Hat staff clarified that that arrangement was just not a great use of their resources. We should make clear here that Red Hat customers and partners can still access RHEL sources via the customer and partner portals. But as Bradley M. Kuhn of the Software Freedom Conservancy has assessed, that is not an option legally available to the RHEL clones, such as Alma or Rocky. And that's the rub. This is a major blow to how they produce those enterprise Linux clones. And it's created a real stir with Alma and Rocky still a week later kind of trying to figure out how they're going to proceed with various ideas being floated around. And there is so, so much to unpack here. So what we wanted to do was keep Linux Action News 
focused on the facts, what actually happened. And then we're going to dig into the implications, the ramifications, the community impact, all that stuff in Linux Unplugged this week. In a follow-up post, Red Hat's Mike McGrath touched on many questions raised by the community and was frank in his assessment of the situation, writing, quote, In a healthy, open-source ecosystem, competition and innovation go hand-in-hand. Red Hat, SUSE, Canonical, AWS, and Microsoft all create Linux distributions with associated branding and ecosystem development efforts. These variants all utilize and contribute to the Linux source code, but none of them claim to be, quote, fully compatible with the others. Ultimately, we do not find value in a RHEL rebuild, and we are not under any obligation to make things easier for rebuilders. This is our call to make. That's about as frank as a large public company is going to get with us. And in follow-up conversations and interviews, Reddit has clarified that they do see value in Fedora and CentOS Stream, and that the sources that they post to Stream's GitHub are the same sources Red Hat is building RHEL from. The work now to rebrand, check for legal compliance, maybe determine where RHEL was forked off from Stream, well, that work would now be on the clone makers if they wanted to use the same sources that RHEL is based on. But there is no denying. This was a shocking change, one that's still being absorbed by the community, although I think in retrospect, it was probably easy to see coming, especially as companies tighten belts and focus on what makes money. I have a lot more to say on this in Unplug this week, but sticking with the facts for now, McGrath touched on that himself in a follow-up post. Quote, There was a time, not too long ago, that Red Hat found value in the work done by rebuilders like CentOS. We pushed our SRPMs out to git.centos.org in a neat package that made them easy to rebuild. We even debranded it for them. More recently, we have determined that there isn't value in having a downstream rebuilder. And there it is. And I think Red Hat's perspective on this is Red Hat Enterprise Linux is a product. CentOS Stream is a project. And so that's where the contribution should be. And I think their point of view is this is an opportunity for the clones to work directly upstream. And if they discover bugs, they could submit bug reports and Red Hat could fix those before they actually ship in Red Hat Enterprise, which would ultimately impact the clone makers anyways. It's complicated though, listeners, so we'd like to know what you think. We have our feedback channels on our Colony Matrix server, or you could send us a boost. We'd like to collect that feedback before we sit down to record Linux Unplugged this weekend, so getting that in as you listen would be great. But you know we're going to be keeping an eye on this story and everything else happening in the world of Linux and open source, so don't miss an episode. Go to linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the ways to get each release. And linuxactionnews.com for contact for ways to get in touch. And don't forget, this conversation will continue in Linux Unplugged 517 this week. You can find it when it's published at linuxunplugged.com slash 517. We'll be back next week with our take on the latest Linux and open source news. Thanks for joining us. And that's all the news for this week. <laughs>